spirit. Just as pride is the root of all passions, the mother of all virtues is humility. This is the most essential quality to acquire in our spiritual life, and yet it is also the most difficult. Of all things, for a man to learn humility is the hardest. The reason for this is that the opposite of humility, pride, is so deeply ingrained in our fallen nature that even to grasp the concept of humility is difficult for us. We all strive to appear greater and better than we are. The grass of the field and the fish and birds and animals don't attempt it. Why do we do this? It's because we were, in reality, at one time, greater and better than we are now. And the shadow of this memory urges us to exaggerate to the exaggeration of our greatness and goodness. This pride is the result of the fall. When we, in the persons of our first parents, were no longer content with God's provision and rebelled against his commandments. Since that time, we have been afflicted with pride, that base desire to put ourselves above everyone and everything else, to become God without God, and perhaps even to become greater than God. This is the foolish delusion under which we live, and it is that which makes humility so hard to grasp. Our Lord, knowing that we would have great difficulty with humility, demonstrated it over and over again by his own actions. He condescended to take our flesh, the flesh of our disobedience. He was born not in a palace as would befit his status, but in a cave. He washed the feet of his disciples and then voluntarily accepted the bitter cup of his passion, the betrayal, the arrest, the false trial, mocking, beating, and scourging, the cross, the nails, the spear, and death, all this and more he willingly took upon himself, even though he is the Lord and creator of all. But even so, we all still have a hard time with humility. Not even his closest disciples could grasp this easily. In the Gospel today, we heard how Jesus told his disciples that he would be arrested and condemned to death, that he would be mocked and scourged and spit upon, that he would be killed and on the third day would rise again from the dead. Hearing this, one would expect that the apostles would be horrified. In fact, we read elsewhere that at one point the apostle Peter cried out, rebuking Jesus, saying, Lord, this should not be. Peter was at least shocked at the idea, but did not understand Jesus' willing self-abasement to undergo this suffering for the salvation of all mankind. In the gospel that we read today, however, we see another reaction by the apostles James and John that's even more off base than Peter's. Having heard Jesus say these things, they decided that this was the time, this was the time, to approach him and ask to be given the honor of sitting at his side when he ascended into his glory as Messiah thinking that this meant he would become king of Israel and throw off the yoke of the Roman overlord. Jesus had just told them that he would suffer, and their greatest concern was to shore their places of honor in his administration. The other apostles, when they heard of this, became angry with James and John, not about the inappropriateness of their action, but because they were upset that James and John were trying to get an unfair advantage. See how here Jesus is trying to teach his disciples about humility by his own example, and they missed the lesson entirely because of their pride. Humility is, is essential for our salvation, and yet we often don't even have a clue about our own pride. Unless we humble ourselves and crucify our pride, we cannot follow Christ. His path is the way of humility, and that must be our way as well. Jesus responds first by asking, Can you drink the cup that I must drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I will be baptized? In this he brought to their attention the suffering of which he had just spoken, and they misread, and that they missed, uh, the, this, that they missed rather, the first time, and indicated that if they wished to follow him, they would have to humble themselves as well. And then to illustrate his point, he tells them, Whosoever will be greatest among you must be the servant of all. In other words, humility is the central core of the kingdom of heaven. And if we wish to be raised up into the kingdom of God, we must first lower ourselves and acquire humility. We must strive not to be better than others, but to serve 
others. And this is a hard lesson in humility, but it is a necessary lesson. If we want to be saved, humble yourself, give up your whole self, and lay it on the altar as sacrifice to our Lord. Imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God, the creator of the universe, the rightful king of all, and yet he set aside and submitted himself to the suffering and difficulty of incarnation. He who is pure and holy put on the soiled garments of our flesh, the prison garments of convicted and condemned rebels. He who is king and ruler of all accepted the life of a peasant living in a land that had been overrun by foreign conquerors. He who made all that exists in its perfection constantly sought out the twisted and spoiled flesh of the blind, the lame, the deaf, the dumb, the demon-possessed, and the foolish, deceived slaves of passion in order to heal them and correct the damage that they had done to his perfect creation. When men in their proud foolishness rejected him, accused him and crucified him, he humbly accepted all of this in order that we might be saved. If only we follow the same path of humility that he trod before us. Today we also remember St. Mary of Egypt, and in her life we see a wonderful example of humility in the greeting between St. Zosimus and St. Mary. After finally catching up to Mary and throwing to her his own cloak so that she could cover herself in modesty, Zosimus threw himself on the ground and asked for her blessing. And she likewise bowed down before him, and thus they lay on the ground prostrate, asking for each other's blessing. And one word alone could be heard from both of them. Bless me. After a while, the woman said to Zosimus, Abba Zosimus, it is you who must give blessings and pray. You are dignified by the order of the priesthood, and for many years you have been standing before the holy altar and offering the sacrifice of the divine mystery. And this flung Zosimus into an even greater uh, terror. At length, with tears, he said to her, O oh, Mother, filled with the Spirit, by your mode of life it is evident that you live with God and have died to the world. The grace granted to you is apparent, for you have called me by name and recognized that I am a priest, even though you have never seen me before. Grace is recognized not by one's orders, but by gifts of the Spirit. So give me your blessing, for God's sake, for I need your prayers. Then finally, giving way before the wish of the elder, the woman said, Blessed, blessed be God who cares for us, for the salvation of men and for their souls. And so this answered, Amen. Fulfill the unworthy petition of an old man now and pray for me, woman sinner. And she answered, You are also a priest. Abizosimus, it is you who must pray for me, for this is your calling. But as we all must be obedient, I will gladly do what you ask. And with the words, she turned to the east, raising her eyes to heaven, and stretching out her hands, she began to pray. Here's an example of humility. Zosimus, who was a priest, who had lived many years in a, mon in, in a monastic, and he lived many years as a monastic, and a quite well-known one, in fact. He humbled himself before a strange, wild woman of the desert. And even when she invoked his priesthood, he set aside that honor that he had been given before the obvious grace that she possessed. She, on the other hand, who had prayed in the company of angels, who had been taught by the Holy Spirit, who lived in the presence of Christ, set aside her own sanctity and humbled herself before Zosimus because of his priesthood. When he finally prevailed upon her to give the first blessing and to pray for him, she responded with a reference that we must all be obedient, and so fulfilled his request to pray. They became servants of one another by their humility. This is how we must meet each other. Rather than seeking to assert our own superior, su superiority, real or imagined, over one another, we have to humble ourselves and be obedient to one another. There is no place in the community of the church for pride, for exalting oneself, of considering oneself to be better than others. Anything that we have that we might that might lift us above one another, wealth, possessions, talent, skill, worldly position, even any holiness that we might have obtained, is not ours, but is given by God. It belongs to Him. And so we set all that aside 
And we stand before God together as servants of one another. We'll soon finish Great Lent and enter into the struggles of Holy Week. We'll have our feet washed, as it were, by Christ himself. We'll receive from him his very own body and blood. We'll be there as he is betrayed, arrested, beaten, mocked, and nailed to the cross. We will stand with his mother and watch him die. We'll take his body from the cross and place it in a grave, and we'll descend with him into Hades. Mourning the loss of our beloved, we will then be filled with the joy of his resurrection, and we will proclaim this triumph to the whole world. But we can do none of this if we do not first humble ourselves, destroy our pride, become the servants of one another, and follow him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 